China, but everyone was it's classic bubble behavior. So I thought I, something's happening to me. It probably isn't good, <laughs> but it you know it might be interesting. Uh -huh. Um, and also, we're all of mixed motives. I mean, we're all, of, uh, you know, of high and low and noble mm -hmm. and base. And it seemed to me that that was a, an acknowledgement that, you know, that's a kind of modernist impulse, uh, you know, to, to, to get to the heart of darkness, you know. So, I mean... Do you feel that you got to the heart of darkness at one point? Well, I mean, there's some... It's harrowing to yeah. read, apparently. I mean, cause, uh, some have people you have said it? that... No, no, yeah. I, I don't want to reread it. <laughs> It is harrowing, and of course, it's so prescient of what has happening now. I assume you were much wiser this time. Yeah, yeah, around. I was. Yeah. No, um, we didn't lose a fortune, but um, but people, of course, who got caught up in the housing bubble and then couldn't, you know, finance mortgages and couldn't pay for them did. Um, but uh, it, I wanted to get at the psychology of it, um, that insensate desire you know, to understand an industry and try to make money out of it. And, it's, and of course, there were plenty of people who did make money. It wasn't entirely mm. irrational. It's just that anyone who enters a bubble as it's expanding rather than at the very beginning is probably going to be a sucker. But it was something where I, f I knew I was slightly out of control, yeah. um, but that it would be interesting to write it down. I, I actually wrote, kept a diary, computer diary, mm. and the diary became the text. I mean, I just kept changing it and rewriting it and making it better. But that was how that one. I see. Evolved. Well, it is. It is a really unputdownable book, and I think for people going through what's going on now, it would they may be learn particularly something about interesting and about behavior. themselves. Yeah. Um, I, you do have one point in here before we move on to your third book that struck me. You talk. You define wealth or what you would feel would be the wealth you would like, and you define it as a home in the city, a home in the country, and five million in liquid assets. That's a lot. Would you still go with that no, definition? I think, I think take it down a little bit? I would take it down. I don't even want a house in the country <laughs> because who, who has the time? You know, that, that's, it's, now, that strikes me as ridiculous. Um, I, and, and my wife and I live in a rather small apartment, and we're, we go away when we can, and we're perfectly happy as far as real estate goes. So, mm. no, I would say that was, that's, that's really um, more than you need to be happy. Of course, you don't get happier when you get richer. Well, the yeah. only thing that happens is you're, food and your transportation gets better. But, um, you know, the rest of the, the essential questions are, of life are what work are you going to do and who are you going to love? Mm. You know, and, and children, I would say, for those who have children. Those are the three things. Absolutely. Uh, and they're not affected all that much by, by wealth. I mean, if you're, if you're unhappy with what you're doing, right. always tell my kids, first figure out what your interests are, what you want to do, then figure out how you're going to make a living out of it. I mean, in a growing economy, which we hope to see again pretty soon, um, this is a good country to take some interest and pursue it, you know, and make it into something that, that pays. Yeah, yeah, I agree uh, with that. In a contracting economy, it seems insane that, you know, and everyone holds their heads and says, you know, what am I going to... So... Uh, but people need to take... Our students, our, our children need to take the longer view, perhaps, and follow their I think in your passion. 20s you're trying to still figure yeah. out what your interests are and who yeah. you are and you can take risks you know and pull back from them if they don't work out right but you have to find as just what you said you have to find the passion first and then worry about the earning the living afterwards mm -hmm. so um, the people who get trapped I mean I feel a lot of kids get trapped by loans if the kids who go to college I mean and they come out of college and they have that and that's rough I mean they have to take sometimes jobs that they don't really want absolutely we uh, see to that pay a off lot the loans. here um, and may, but maybe they change later. You know, they yeah. find something else. Well, I want to move on to your third book, okay. a slimmer volume, Snark. Yes, it can be read in an evening very easily. Yes. Um, it's mean. Here's the subtitle. Oh, it's here we mean, go again with the subtitle. It's mean, it's personal, and it's ruining our conversation. So, Snark. What is Snark? I, I have to say, before I read it, I guess I didn't really know. I've heard the term, but I didn't know what it well, meant. Well, first of all, it's a made-up word. Lewis okay. Carroll used it in a oh, nonsense poem in 1876, of, yeah. The Hunting of the Snark. It's a mythical beast. And you never do find out what it is, <laughs> um, except it's dangerous. But and by degrees, it, beca it, it began to mean nasty abuse, uh, sarcastic, not, not just sarcastic, but vituperative, angry, personal, finger-pointing, rug-pulling abuse. Okay? And there's... Uh, a lot more of it, it's always been there. It's part of human nature, right? I mean, I trace it back to the Greek 
drinking clubs, go back to the classical period again. It seems to me there was a lot more of it. I wrote this in the summer of 2008, and it seemed that it's because of the internet, because a black man was running for president, because of the crisis in journalism, where newspapers and magazines were beginning to fail, and yet no one could make money in new media, mm -hmm. in the internet, I felt that the tone of a lot of the language was beginning to get rougher and crueler and nastier because that was the way to grab people's attention. So the difference, so that was the difference between snark and irony. Now, I, maybe we can, you can define this by you make the example, you give the example in the book of John Stewart as not snarky and Maureen well, Dowd as snarky. Stewart, certainly, when he describes Karl Rove's head as looking like a piece of unleavened dough or something like That's that. That's snarky. That's, yes, but his, his pal Colbert, uh -huh. if I can just skip to Colbert for a second, certainly is practicing irony if you define it as when you say one thing and mean its opposite. Now, it's kind of sophisticated literary form. Colbert is a liberal. He pretends to be a conservative. He puts on his Bill O'Reilly rubber face mask, right? And he interviews people and he takes conservative positions. But he exaggerates them in such a way as to show what he thinks are their absurdity, okay? That's irony. You're saying one thing, you mean the opposite. Snark is just insult. It's a much lower form. It doesn't have that kind of ambition. It's the point of it is to degrade it's whoever. It's to degrade no yeah. matter what. I, I felt reading this that perhaps your thought was that to be even me, to be comic and possibly even mean in support of an ideolo ideology or an idea that you truly believe in would not be snarky. Correct. Is no, that that's correct? that's good. That's a good reading. So I agree with that. So would you say that's true for the right as well as sure. the left? Sure. Why not? Yes. So what about uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh? Rush Limbaugh um, just seems to me an insult artist who can't get anything right. So. Um, I, it's a little hard for me to um, let him through the, you know, into the gates of, of high humor. I mean, it, it seems to me he's out to destroy. Um, and now, he, yes, it, it's true. He has values. He has ideas. But the, the expression seems to me so low, a lot of it, mm. and so nasty um, that he plays on prejudices, which he doesn't quite name. He plays on fears, which he doesn't quite name and he manipulates. In other words, it's close to demagoguery. Um, so, okay. anything that... And you uh, feel with Maureen Dowd that she doesn't have a particular set of beliefs Maureen and will Dowd, just poke. New York Times columnist. Yes, please. Yeah. Is very talented. She's very funny. Um, there isn't much she can't do with language. Um, and I admire her. But I think... She's opportunistic in her ridicule and goes after anyone who's vulnerable in any way whatsoever. Mm. So in 2000, she went after both Gore and Bush. And with Gore, who was certainly the more serious of the two, she would ridicule him one week for being so excessively sensitive to women's concerns that he was practically lactating. And the next week, she would say he had been to the gym and was, was ridging his abs. So in other words, she was getting him one way or the other. It mm. seemed to me opportunistic, and she never discussed what his ideas were. My problem with Marine Dad is he doesn't seem to have any political philosophy or any ideas Underpinning. underneath the ridicule. And now she's doing it to Obama, uh, who initially she held back from. Well, uh, we're almost out of time, but I wonder if you could end this interview by reading what a quite eloquent paragraph from the end, the epilogue of great books. Um, it's a paragraph in your own words, and it's followed by a, um, some lines from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And right. I think it would be a nice way to end. Well, here I am summing up and trying to answer the critique of Western classics as a you know, core curriculum, as a kind of basic reading. So <clears throat> it's the end of our journey, and I, I wrote, uh, what can be achieved through culture is the greatest range of pleasure and soulfulness and reasoning power that any of us is capable of. The courses in the Western classics force us to ask all those questions about self and society we no longer address without embarrassment. The questions our media-trained habits of irony have tricked us out of asking. In order to ask those questions, students need to be enchanted before they are disenchanted. They need to love the text before they attack the subtext. They need to read before they disappear into the aridities of electronic information. 
They need a chance to make a self before they are told that it doesn't exist. They need a strong taste of Europe so they can become better Americans. Uh, Walt Whitman said it this way in Leaves of Grass. Dead poets, philosophers, priests, martyrs, artists, inventors, governments long since, language shapers on other shores, nations once powerful, now reduced, withdrawn or desolate, I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have left wafted hither. I have perused it, own it, it is admirable, moving a while among it, think nothing can ever be greater, nothing can ever deserve more than it deserves, regarding it all intently a long while then dismissing it. I stand in my place with my own day here. Here lands female and male. Here the airship and the heiress ship of the world. Here the flame of materials. Here spirituality, the translatress, the openly avowed, the ever tending, the finale of visible forms, the satisfier after long, after due long awaiting, now advancing. Yes, here comes my mistress, the soul. Thank you so much, David Denny. Thanks a lot. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview. <laughs>